Hey, hello, everybody, and I'm sitting here with Jeff Westfall today on the Uber to the Pits podcast. Jeff, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So, uh, you know, you and I were talking a little bit beforehand and just kind of checking up and seeing how family's doing during the uh, red flag season. Kind of odd for us to be around so much during the, you know, middle of uh, race season. It's like Stalin leaving pit lane. You know, you get one or two races in the beginning of the year. You're ready to go. You let her rip and blah. And now you're st- <laughs> you got you to get pe- pushed back to the stall to get re-jumped and start going again. Yeah. Hopefully, we'll be going again soon. So, uh, Jeff, just, you know, kind of start out with our listeners. And how would you get into motorsports? You know, when, uh, what started it for you? Uh, I mean, thinking all the way back to the first year that I spent driving any form of car on a racetrack um, or any form of race car on a racetrack, uh, you know, it really stemmed from a, a huge passion for cars, just a very general one growing up, um, loving all the racing movies, being obsessed with things that go. And it wasn't necessarily always cars. It could have been bikes or quads or anything that I could make roll. Bicycle, I spent a lot of time riding and being outside because I was always a very active person um, at a young age. And so... I would say like right around my collegiate years, a gift was to go to a racing school um, for my family, which was awesome. And so I went to uh, the Skip Barber driving school, which was at Laguna Seca at the time with their old tube frame, you know, formula cars that they had. And a lot of drivers have used that as a launching pad um, to move up through motorsports. Um, And so I kind of knew that going into it, but it was really more of just this neat experience for me doing it. And Uh, I showed up to take the course and there were other drivers who had previously been racing go-karts and intended to race the race series and use it as a launching pad. And I was as quick, if not faster than them right out of the gate. And I really knew very little. And I went into it trying to be a sponge and just absorb as much as I could. Um, And so that was kind of the first inkling of a, huh, that's interesting. And then I did a Red Bull driver search um, and I made it pretty far. I made it to the semifinals where I was basically on the third day up against kids who had like national karting titles and had already been racing formula cars. And, uh, it was Danny Sullivan who pulled me aside, one of the judges and said, look, there's 30 of you here. I've seen everybody's resume. You've made it through multiple cuts, um, nationally down to this level. You have zero experience. We get that. And you know, you didn't get selected for the final seven to go to the shootout, but you should keep going. And I said, that's awesome. But you know, what does that mean? I don't know what that have no experience. No one in my family did it. I didn't really understand the next yeah. step. And that's kind of the trickiest part about getting started in motorsports, right? Is it's, you look at collegiate sports, you look at stick and ball sports, and there's a very defined path that will take you from, you know, your school to uh, a collegiate level into a semi-pro and then ultimately to a farm team or a pro team, right? There's that ladder that you can follow. Exactly. And in racing, it's not, it's not necessarily clear that it's there and it, it might actually not even be there to be fair. Um, You've seen guys jump laterally up the sport where they they get up to a certain point in formula cars, much like myself, um, and then stepping over to sports cars or stepping into stock cars or vice versa and kind of bouncing around. Um, And so backtracking to my story, I kind of did a little bit of research and I figured out that the racing school series would have been a good one to revisit. So I went back and did the next class in order to get licensed to be able to do it. And and it was a great way to kick it off because it was uh, fixed equipment meaning that everyone had the same same car, right? All machines are slightly specs, different. Specs, you learn that as you get into it. Yeah. Having said that, yeah. you don't have to turn a wrench. They're all prepped. You show up, you draw a number, that's your machine, go make it, make it around the track as fast as you can. And it was great for personal development because if I saw someone doing something that was faster in one given corner visually ahead of me, I could tell right then and there, there's something I still need to learn. And that's how I went into it, really. And that's that was the start for me. So that's, um, sorry, to interrupt, but that's, I mean, that's such a big key right there is being willing to learn and watch other people, you know, for myself, when I would be, whether it's in the car or on the motorcycle, I'd always try to be with that faster group, mm-hmm. whether or not I was at that point to be in that group. I, you know, I'm not going to hold anybody back. I'm going to be aware of my situation but I'm also going to learn and push myself to be into that group and advance so I can learn what these guys are doing to make themselves faster. For sure. And, and the one caveat to that, which I will say after years in the sport, is that the blessing that I didn't know I had at that time was that it was a fixed car and fixed make series. 
right? And it made it very visually apparent and it made it very easy to trust that, hey, that machine can go do it. Knowing what I know now, you have to be very careful in a lot of different formats, whether it's a DE day or you're trying to go up through the NASA ranks where you have every car left, right, and center built at home with different things that are going on. I mean, yeah. there's there's mechanical abilities that certain machines have and other ones don't. And I've learned that in mixed manufacturer racing. You know, if you're racing a Corvette versus a 911, there are certain corners the 911 is just going to eat the Corvette's lunch out of the out of the corner. Like when you get down to a dig and you go to a second gear, leave, let's get traction and go. It doesn't matter who you are. The Corvette won't match it just based on the geometry of the car. Having said that, there's areas where the vet is going to do better than the Porsche. And my point is that you need to understand what you're up against. Yeah. Don't look at somebody in a, you know, a LaFerrari and you're out there in an MR2 and you're trying to chase them, right? Like it's little bits and differences, but in a grand scheme, keeping an eye on how can I improve is is kind of the, the moral of that story. It was going into the beginning of my career, understanding, look, you don't know anything in this. You have a little bit of feel for the car and that that is the thing you really want to develop the most is the feel for the car and experiment and try and make yourself faster and oh, this corner was quicker on a split and it felt like this and you're just filling the toolbox with yeah. all those experiences. It's like uh, Mario and Jody used to say he hated driving with the seat pad because he wanted his butt to feel what his car was doing. Yeah, I mean, make no mistake, the race cars are not comfortable. Like they talk about, oh, they're making them more comfortable, driver friendly. Like when you're when you're in them, I mean, even nowadays where they have a lot more creature comforts, we're still 130 degrees inside. You're wrapped yeah. head to toe. You're spending hours in there. The vibration, the noise, the seat is not a particularly good angle for your low back on the brakes. I mean, it. We have uh, usually we have physios for the long races that help us because our our backs will lock like lock up and get super tight because we're leveraging the brake pedal with anywhere between a um, hundred bar and 150 bar on, uh, on the brake pedal. It's a, it's a massive PSI hit. You do it every brake zone of every lap for hours and the same spot in your back just gets beat up and bruised and swells. And so it's, it's something that, you know, as you get further into the sport, you need to know going in, like this is not just to sit on your couch and go for it activity. You need to prepare for that. Exactly. You know, especially like driving around a track like Sebring where you're rattling your teeth loose. Sebring, you know what's funny is like you go into the 24 at the beginning of the year at Daytona and you think, all right, this is, at, you know, if it's cut evenly, it's eight hours in the car. Depending on strategy, I might spend 10 in the car. I need to be ready to be able to do 10 or 12 just in case because yeah. you never know. And so you think you have this gauntlet ahead of you and then you go to Sebring two months later. Well, in this case, it's going to be later in the year, but you have half the distance to do. And you're like, all right, there's still three of us and there's half the distance. Like it's going to be a piece of cake <laughs> every year. I leave Sebring thinking, man, I'm way more tired than I was at Daytona. <laughs> Your body just gets destroyed. I mean, that the bumps and turn 17 and one, actually, one's oh, yeah. pretty bumpy, too. They don't talk about it often, but um, you're, it's like your head is bouncing off the chair multiple times a lap, and then the car's bottoming out, and there's nothing you can do. Is if you set the car up for that bump, you're still going to hit the bump and bottom out, and then you're going to be too stiff everywhere else. So it's, it's really a challenge, definitely, yeah. for sure. It's a... So you did the uh, Skip Barber School, and then what was your next progression from Skip Barber? So personally, at that time, I went from there to Formula 2000, which now would be equivalent to what F4 is. And F4 yeah. is actually growing stateside, so it's it's a, a similar format. There was a lot of young kids transitioning, again, from go-karts, but most had been in some junior formula or a school moving through it. Um, it's a two-liter, four-cylinder formula car with wings. Um, it has downforce, but not a significant enough amount that you're really uh, deciding how the car behaves based on the aero load. It's still a very mechanical car with a little bit of aero help, which I think is an important step because when you introduce a big aero load to a car, it's often hard to feel uh, or to know correctly how do I operate and give feedback and set the machine up and prioritize the aero over the mechanical. So I think you need to spend enough time as a new driver in a mechanical grip car and get used to the sidewalls flexing because every tire is different. And I will say this again, every tire is different, <laughs> even if it's the same size and it's a slick, but it's from a competitor's brand. Yep. The setup on the car is going to be different. The way the car behaves is going to be different. And that's, that's what you really need to learn. Cause that's what you feel. So that was my step. Um, it was a Van Diemen chassis at the time. Now I believe there's like a Tatus, uh, Miguel, they're all carbon tubs now. Um, and they, you know, they weren't particularly powerful. They made under 200 horsepower right around that number. 
Um, but wicked fast around the track. I mean, we were still doing low one minute 33s around Sonoma Raceway just because they were light. I mean, my minimum speed in the carousel was 94 miles an hour at the slowest point. I mean, it's they taught you a lot because they were so nimble. Um, and from there, I stepped up to uh, I tested an Indy Lights car and I also tested a, a Grand Am GT car after that uh-huh. championship. So I, I won that championship in 2008. Um, and that was the year that the big bank crash happened in terms of timing, thinking about the business aspect of it. And the step from there, the budget to operate a professional or good effort in F2000 to go to Indy Lights was 3X if you were going to do it in terms of what money you needed to, to go, sponsorship dollars and so on and so forth. And I had an opportunity to run Indy Lights at a discount because of the championship win. And I, I was awarded the test for free, which was great to get to experience an Indy Lights car, which was a 450 horsepower V8 formula car with a decent amount of aero on it. Decent um, aero, lightweight. Yeah. I mean, it was heavier than the F2000. I mean, the two liter car with me in it, I believe, was like 1,200 pounds. Um, the Lights car with me in it was like 1,600, which is starting to get a little heavier for a formula car, but it's still pretty light relative. I mean, pretty. Yeah, especially with the horsepower and the arrow you have in there. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, you know, and then I tested the GT car that same week, later in the week. At, uh, I think we went to Button Willow for that one. Um, and because of the manufacturer involvement, I made the first critical business decision in my motorsports career at that point. Um, I recognized that the funding or the sponsorship that was going in Formula Car from being in it for about two years was very, very private. It was either huge amounts of family money for a lot of guys who've, who've run their way all the way up to IndyCar, or it was a company who's not tied to an automaker. It's usually like a software company or someone yeah. that wants to be there that doesn't really have a vested interest in the automotive industry uh, in terms of making things. And so Telecom, based you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So based on that market and the, and the situation, the economy that I could see coming with the, the crash that we had and the, the recession... I thought that the manufacturer subsidization was a very, very valuable tool going through what's seemingly going to be a pretty bleak couple of years of finding sponsorship and getting people to go do things because the economy was really struggling. I mean, companies had huge layoffs. And so I pivoted my focus and tried to find opportunities in the GT car field, Paddock, doing Daytona 24 hours, doing stuff in Grand Am back then um, with the sponsors that I had at that point. Um, the money could go a little further than formula cars in terms of the cost to run the machine. There's a little bit of subsidization, so that was that was the point where I kind of pivoted. Even though I love formula cars um, and aero, I went towards the GT uh, path at that point. That was around 2008, 2009 transition. And so you go to the GT. What was your first? So uh, going 20, so 2009, 2010. What was your first GT ride? Uh, it was the 24 Hours of Daytona with PR1 Motorsports. They had a, a Pratt and Miller tube frame car which had gone through the tube frames back then. That was how all the GT cars were built, except yep. the Porsche. Um, and they had different bodies on them. They started with the GTO. The GTO won for like two or three years, and they got enough BOP that the GTO was no longer competitive. So they took the body off and made it a Pontiac GXPR. And then it was a new BOP. And so that, that did really well for a couple of years. That was right around the time that I got into it, towards the tail end of the GXPR. And then like the year after, I was in that seat, um, it turned into a Camaro. They kept rebodying the same tub for like a decade. Because at the point there, you know, GM got rid of the Pontiac brand. So it's like, okay, we're not going to be racing Pontiac, so might as well put Chevrolet on there. Yeah, and it was, I mean, the chassis interior was, uh, it was really well built. I mean, it's a lot to say for Pratt & Miller, and especially, it was a really cool thing for me to get involved in a car like that early on, and then knowing what I know now about how much thought goes into those machines, and how durable they make them and where the radiator sits. I mean, there's so much forward thinking for a car that's going to go through a gauntlet, like a 24 hour that, that those machines are put together that way. So that was, yeah. that was the machine I drove. And those were the, the races. I, uh, I did the six hours of long. It's Glenn. Um, you know, I, I did the longer races like that. I kind of attacked the longer ones and tried to get myself tuned in on more of an endurance mindset, which personally required more changes. It required, um, getting a, adapted to a longer seat time, right? Instead of a formula car race that's 30 minutes to an hour, there were times where they asked me to do a double or a triple and I'm in the car for almost three hours and it's super hot and you don't have wind blowing in your face. <laughs> and it was, you know, it was a different, it was a different situation. And then you had, to, while you're cooked and you're literally buzzing and you feel like you're going to throw up at the end of that three hours, you have to get out and get your teammate in as fast as possible with no mistakes. Yep. And 
wearing a helmet and gloves and doing buckles. And it's, there's a lot of preparation that, that goes into that. And it, even still, I mean, it's not something we take lightly. I, we do driver change practice every weekend. Yeah. And I mean, driver change practice is key just because of the fact that, that, you know, just like the tire changers, the feelers, you know, refuelers, they do all their practice in, you know, the movements down, you know, doing that driver change practice can be just as detrimental to a win or a loss as changing the tire or refueling the car. I put it this way, right? And a lot of people listening are probably have been on the track before and they understand how hard it is to find that last second or even that last half a second when you really get to the maximum yep. of what you think the machine can achieve. It's much harder to find an extra second in a lap or over the course of a race to find speed in the car on track than it is to not make mistakes and lose three seconds in pit lane, right? It's 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 a much, much easier thing to lose. So it's something you have to keep in, in track of and, and make sure you're mindful of in, in long races for sure. Yeah. So you kind of did the fill-in with the endurance races. What was, you know, really, like you said, you had to change your mindset, but physically too, it's a big, it's a big change going from those 30 minute, you know, 45 minute hour races in a formula car, which does take a full beating on your car you know, on your body, especially if you're in a car with good aero, um, just because of the G forces being able to carry more speed through the corners and whatnot. But then it's a whole different physio thing that you have to do with your body sitting in the car for an hour and a half, two hours, three hours at a time. And then not only that, but mentally, you know, you're, you know, you're getting arm pump, your back's killing you, and yet you're still trying to have to stay focused. Okay, I just made it through, you know, I'm getting ready to go through the carousel at Daytona, but, uh, you know, my arm's pumping. How, how do you, do you prepare and stay focused for that new change? Of something that you weren't used to so on the mental side i use a lot of simulators um, because the mental acuity is as important as the physical side if you start slipping mentally you're going to make a mistake you put a wheel wrong you wreck the car and then it's a huge financial problem for your the rest of your season for the team so to me it's as important as the physical aspect the same thing can happen if you get physically tired you get lazy you get slow you turn in a little later, a little different in cadence. You, you put a tire wrong, you dip a wheel and off you go. So physically, um, I started working on base miles and then there's a couple of people around me at that time that were doing triathlons and Ironmans that I knew. And I kind of asked them on their advice and what they did for training. And, and I say base miles, meaning that if you're, if you're maximum, like V you, you're not doing VO two max, you're not sprinting. You're not like yeah. completely out of breath all the time. But if that's 100%, you're going to do like three to four days a week at 80%. And it could be on a bike, it could be in a pool, it could be running. But I started to build my base up and just do, I mean, there were time, there was a, a point when I was really militant about it that I was doing at minimum four miles a day, five days a week running. And then I started doing longer. I got on the bike and I did a 75 mile bike ride, just literally keeping the heart rate in that same zone that it is in the race car. And, and that was one reason that that I figured I wanted to do that is that I happened to wear my heart rate monitor that I had acquired for this entire phase of my life while being on a bicycle. I wore it when I was on track in a time attack car in 2010, a track I knew very well. I was very calm. The cars were pretty nutty back then. It was a thousand horsepower, four wheel drive Subaru doing burnouts in third gear. <laughs> um, but you know, nonetheless, like something I should have been like, all right, it's, you know, I know this corner's flat. This one's not I go through the whole thing. And even with all that, I was at 156 beats per minute for just the three laps that I was in the car. Yeah. And so I said, okay, if that's my range, like 150 to 170, I need to go train in that range. And so I'm going to spend at least, I need to be able to double my stint in the car. So if they're going to ask me to do two hours, I need to know that my body can do four hours at 170 beats per minute. And that's kind of where I, I started targeting it. Yeah. Cause I mean, it's, it does take a huge toll on your body, especially if you're a new driver coming in for an endurance race for you know, the 24 hour Daytona, it's going to put a big toll on you. It is. And and the other thing being a competitor and I'm naturally a very competitive person, uh, as you probably expect, but it doesn't matter what it is that have to be race cars or just competitive in general. I looked at it as if I'm not doing this, someone else will, right? yep. there's only so many opportunities out there. And if I'm not in good enough shape and I make one mistake because of my fitness, there's probably a hundred people that are equally as fit, if not more fit that are waiting for a chance in line. And so, I can't let that be 
a catalyst towards my own success or, or failure. Really, I need to be able to to you know go grab what I want to go grab. So that I'm not going to let the fitness be the reason. Yeah. So, how long did you run with Pratt Miller and the you know Camaros? Was that up until 2011, 2012, and then that? Yeah, that so funding became an issue because obviously it's more expensive either way when you leave the junior formulas. Um, and yeah. that was with PR1. It was a Pratt and Miller car, but it was okay. a, a separate team that owned the car. Um, and so I ran with them through 2010 in select races. And I started doing Time Attack at the same time. Uh, one of the performances that I had in Daytona caught the eye of a reporter. He was friends with a shop that was local to me in California that needed a driver for their Time Attack car. And that's how that whole thing went down the road. Um, and I ran Time Attack for a couple years. I had another cameo in, in Grand Am in the Continental Tire Series, which was a slightly less complex car or less purpose-built. It was more of a road car converted into a race car. It was an M3 BMW. Um, and I ran for a team that, at the time, it seemed really odd for a team to go belly up mid-season. And then I started to figure out that it can happen at any time. <laughs> so I ran for them for you know, one point two seasons we got like two races into the next year and then all of a sudden it folded um and then uh started you know, coaching a little bit uh ran some time attack got a couple one-off races here and there and then i was back in grand am in the gt cars again but in a ferrari in 2013 um for scuderia corsa okay and that was kind of that that three or four year path through the murky waters of the economy and everything else gotcha just so people know and because you know we've talked a lot about formula cars and grand dam and stuff like that but what exactly is a time attack car for somebody that may not know what a time attack car is so in general time attack is a form of racing that started in japan it became really popular with car people who modified car street cars basically and the general premise of it is to take a street car something that you can buy on the showroom floor and there's generally three classes a very very mild like nothing done a mid-grade there's quite a bit done and then an unlimited which means you can go as far as you want category and you take some road car and convert it to whatever of those three levels that you'd like and you go compete in a class of like-minded people with like-minded machines but it can be any make or model um and so you in like in that era i was driving a subaru but there was a bunch of Mitsubishi Evos because it's a natural rival. They both are all-wheel drive, kind of rally-esque four-cylinders with turbos. Um, there was an Acura NSX that was a pretty high-dollar build. There was uh, there was quite a few cars. There was a couple of old converted race cars that had bigger engines than they were supposed to, like the uh, Brandon Davis ran a Mustang that was a World Challenge Mustang, so full carbon fiber, wide body, <laughs> flat bottom, like 800 horsepower V8. I mean, big, big build and stuff. So there's there were some neat machines, but it was very much that, like, you know, you have to just focus on yourself and your own machine because yeah. it's so bespoke at that point. And, it's, you know, some of these Summit Act cars are absolutely insane, especially with some of the era they put on them. Yeah, it's it's generally and it's generally not a very high dollar um, operation in terms of the money put in right? With relative to professional racing. Yeah. It's not cheap. Uh, but they don't have aerodynamicist drawing CFD models, although it started to go that way a little bit the last three or four years. Uh, back then, it was like in your backyard, like, well, this should work. I think this aero piece will make more downforce. Let's try it. Let's fab away on, and put it on the car. And and so then you you basically in that form of racing, you're racing a stopwatch. And so you, it's it's a great tell all. I mean, if you guys make the car better with some aero piece that you're not sure about, and all of a sudden you're half a second a lap faster, you know, well, they're you're, you're on the right track exactly. Yeah. So you start with Scudero Ferrari, and how's that season go for you? And then uh, where I'm going is you go from Ferrari and then you have a couple other years. And then you also, so how many years were you with Scuderia? I was with Scuderia Corsa. Um, there's been a relationship from 2013 till now, basically. Yeah. Uh, but it's in different forms. And so I helped them a little bit on the, on the customer side uh, after I stopped driving the car with them. But I was uh for and for you know their own business dealing reasons but I, I worked from 2013 it was kind of a fill-in role they had uh, two drivers signed up one of them had an issue i filled in after by race three out of ten uh then there was another rotation where i was out of the car and then i got back in for the last two races it was this kind of a piecemeal thing but out of six races i think i was on the podium four times for them 
So we had a pretty good year in terms of the races we were there. Um, and then 2014, I ran the whole season with them. Um, and then in 15, I got involved with uh, the Glickenhaus project, which yeah. was Jim Glickenhaus's bespoke GT3 race car that was, you know, conceptualized and built. And uh, it was just after Daytona 2015, I think we were over in Italy shaking it down. Uh, and that was a big development project because it was a brand new car that didn't come from a road car before. And it wasn't from a, a group that had been building race cars for 10 years, 20 years already. It, everything was fairly new. And so there was a lot of R&D needed to be done. I mean, conceptualizing or putting it on, and yes, it works, but it works like this and we need it to work like that. And so a lot of, you know, construction and tear down, rebuild, try this. A really, really neat project to be involved with. I was, I was very fortunate to be called upon by Chris Rude and Jim Glickenhaus for that. And also the nice thing is with that Glickenhaus, they give you the opportunity where you race the 24 hour Nürburgring. Yeah, which the 24 hour Nürburgring being probably one of the bucket list tracks for me as soon as I got into even like simulators and understanding all that way back to the beginning of my career, just because it was so nutty. I mean, you knew it was like the reset button in the beginning. Everyone probably hits that thing at least 10 <laughs> times while they try to make one lap together. Well, not even this. Let's make it clear. Not even going one lap, but even just trying to get through the, you know, series of the first 10 or 20 corners. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, it's true. The place is super challenging. And what ended up being true for me to learn it in the simulator was exactly the same in real life. I learned it in thirds. So I focused, I just, I basically oversimplified it in my head. I went into it knowing like, look, whatever happens from, you know, minute number three to the end of the lap, I don't care, but I'm focusing on minute zero to minute three. I want to learn the first third of the track and just, you know, focus, 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 run that, run that, run that, and then start shifting to the second third. Now the first third was already kind of ingrained because I'd done enough repetition, moved it to the third third after the second one was the same, same, but the reality of it is it just takes time. Uh, yeah. And when I got there in real life, I already knew every corner. I knew which way it went. I was never surprised by any direction change or any blind section because I'd seen it so many times. Yet it still took 40 laps or 25 to 40 laps to feel like, okay, I trust the surfaces. I trust the cambers that I didn't see in the game because it looks flat. Like a lot of surfaces look even left to right. Almost every corner is banked to some degree. And some are more than others. And some are banked on the inside, but not in the middle. And like you need to learn all of those things. Um, so it definitely, it was the same process all over again. I had a head start, but. It was something that needed to be uh, taken very seriously and like practically and just gone through it step by step. And what was the first year you did the 24 hour? Uh, we ran the 20, I believe it was the 2016 was the first year we competed in the 24 hour. And then the uh, 2017 was the year you got the pole. Mm, or, yeah. yeah. You, know, you know what? I think we ran 15, but we had an issue with the car. So we didn't actually race in the race. Okay. Six, 16, we did. We ran into the race and had pretty good ones. 17 was the year I qualified on the pole, yep. which was and a pretty big accomplishment for them. Still hold as the only American to hold the pole on the 24 hour Nürburgring. Correct. Yeah. It was, uh, I believe it was 47 years in running that year in the 2017 when I did it. And I was the, there was only two non-Germans in the history of 47 years, um, to even, to ever get the poll. And I was the only American to do it. Um, and what was actually a really neat, uh, piece of that was that Connor Filippi was running for Audi at that point and he was P2 and we were only a few tenths apart. So we had stars and bars on P1 and P2 of that race. That's cool. Pretty, yeah. So then you did um, now, and then I would, I'd see you at the track also coaching, you know, um, you're working with a lot of guys with uh, Bob if I had a competition with, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Sean and, you know, how is it different being still a competitive driver that gets to go and compete, but then on the off weekends comes and coaches? Being being competitive, I know because I'm competitive too. It's like I look at these guys and I'd be like, okay, you're doing, you know, I do my coaching part, but at the same time, in the back of my head, it's like, damn, I really just want to be in the car competing with these guys right now. Yeah, it's it's tricky, you know. I mean, you you go into if you're make, trying to make this a business and you're trying to do this, you know, something you really really want to do, you go into it thinking about how do I get in the car, how do I improve myself, you know, thinking about your craft and and perfection, right? You're constantly striving for perfection, even though we know it'll never be perfect, but you want yeah. to get as close as you can. 
And when you try and help somebody else out, you find there's a, a, a very quickly, there's a struggle internally where you really want to help them and you have to quiet your own desire to get in, fix it for them. You want them to <laughs> learn. You have to, you have to figure out how to make them learn the lessons that you learned. Right. So look yeah. back at life. And that's exactly what I did when I was helping Sean McAllister out a uh, really talented young guy in Beverly Hills who's been running Porsches for a while. I coached him in that West Coast Championship for many years. I'm helping him now in the IMSA Cup Championship he's running, which mirrors a lot of my race weekends as well, so I'm already there. Um, and I'm, I'm just keeping an eye on him and making sure that, you know, he's learning the lessons he needs to learn along the path that, you know, things that I did and maybe took me half a season to learn. If I can expedite that for him and make him learn it in a quarter of a season, that's awesome. You know what yeah. I mean? It speeds up his progression. So um, it's trying to get them to trying to get the driver to have the epiphany, make them have the epiphany, but kind of feed, you know, lead the horse to the water of that epiphany. Yeah. So, and then 20, so 2016, 2017, and then 2018, where did you kind of go with your career? So in 18, uh, we started a program uh, called Peregrine Racing. Um, there's two uh, owners here in the Bay Area, um, Samir and Mark, uh, that I've known. And we put a program together and kind of with Steve Dynan um, and got the band back together per se. So um, I'd met Tyler McQuarrie in the Motorsport team back in like 2010 or 11 when we ran those uh, Continental Tire cars. Mm -hmm. Steve Dynan was our engineer back then. Um, we kind of got the group back together Fast forward in 2018 with Mark and Samir and two Audi R8 GT4s and set our eyes on the IMSA um, Sports Car Championship, which, again, was the Continental Tire Sports Car Championship for 2018. It changed yeah. in 19. It's same race series, different name. Um, and that was that was also the year I started uh, doing some work with uh, WeatherTech in their GT3 car. So back with Scuderia Corsa um, and, and running uh, a full season of long races with them again. And so it was, so the, um, you Cooper Gunner and Asandro. Uh, it was, uh, Tony V Lander Cooper okay. and myself. Yeah. And Alessandro this year, we had him at Daytona in yeah. 18. We had Dominic Farnbacher okay. with us for Daytona. Um, and so that was for me doing running two different cars on the same weekend, running a GT three car with, significantly more aero and bigger tires and more motorsports based equipment and running a GT4 car, which was more of a production based came off the street. It's been modified a little bit. Um, Audi R8 yeah. it had some aero on it too, but a lot, a lot less than the GT3 cars do a lot less. And then when you run the sport cup series with the GT4 cars, you guys are the fast cars on track competing against the TCR cars and stuff where the yeah. GT3 cars, you guys are kind of the, uh, you know, the slower car, the car on track yeah, with, the, <laughs> with the DPIs and the GTLMs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so that kind of, how, do, how is it for you, you know, like a 24 hour race or a 12 hour race when you have one of these DPI cars coming up around, you know, flashing the lights or, you know, even it's probably some, same thing with uh, Nürburgring trying to stay focused at night with the faster cars coming up or heading back markers and trying to get around them. Sure. I mean, traffic in itself, the easiest way to answer that is that traffic is its own avenue of learning that needs to happen. I mean, it's really, it's complex because you have a lot of variables. You have, you have your grip of your tire on the ideal line. You have the grip of your tires off of the ideal line that may be dirty with marbles or dust or dirt. So, making that adjustment and then you have a car ahead of you that may or may not see you and so you have just on the overtaking of a slower car you have at least those three three things you need to consider uh and then depending on the race series you may have faster cars behind you trying to overtake at the same time and so situational awareness is super key um in those moments i can say i've i've been had close calls and i've called upon every sensory thing that I have, right? I've, I've heard a car on my right corner. I can't see them. I don't even know they're there, but I heard the engine note and I heard the brake and I knew there was someone in the right corner. So I had to leave room when I went through a chicane, you know, like things that you know, if, if you didn't think about that and you turned in and then all of a sudden you're spinning because you guys touched that can cause a big problem, especially in a long race. Yeah. Um, and Nürburgring, 
the GT3 cars are the fastest out there, so you're only overtaking slower cars, which, because it's so narrow, is not an easy feat. It's a very difficult thing. Um, and in, in the Michelin Pilot Challenge, which is the GT4 series, as it's called now, formerly the Continental Tire Sports Car Challenge Championship, um, you're also the fastest car on track. So you're overtaking slower cars. So you at least don't have to worry about the faster car thing. You may be racing someone in your own category and get held up by traffic and have a little bit of an accordion and have to manage that. But it's not like in the GT3 WeatherTech series uh, where I'm in like the Ferrari GT3 car and the TPIs are coming by us 30 miles an hour faster. And th to me, those are that's the hardest one because you're racing amongst yourselves and you're fighting for every inch you can. The cars are aero sensitive, so you have to be smart about when you try and pass. And then you have three other categories of cars that are faster than you racing at the same time. Yeah. And particularly with the DPs, when you get to a place like Road Atlanta, they were almost 10 seconds a lap faster wow. around a two mile circuit at Road Atlanta. And we were doing 160 down the back straight and they were like 190. And so you, we would end up getting into a break zone where you're like basically almost locking the rear. The ABS is starting to clip on back and forth. The car's chattering and, and dancing around and you're fighting with a Mercedes next to you or an Acura or something like that. And the DP is still on the gas pedal and he comes down, shooting down the inside, breaking two brake boards later. You know what I mean? It's like, that was that's the most challenging part of it because the arrow they have and the top speed that they achieve it often feels like they come out of nowhere yeah and i mean that's the that's the other thing that you know a lot of younger drivers that haven't had an experience of with you know back in the old probably world challenge days that used to be speed vision uh challenge is you had the gt3 cars the sc the tc cars all on track together just kind of like what you have with the weather tech series right now with the DPIs, the GTLMs and the GTDs. And it's just because you guys will be racing your own, your own race going for overall position as well. Not only just in your class, but the overall class. And, you know, you're in your, you're in your race, you're coming up in the Corvettes and Porsche on their race in the GTLM. And then you have a DPI interrupting it. And it's like, okay, there's only so much real estate that's going to happen here. <laughs> Where am I going? Yeah, and I think if I could give advice to people who are kind of dipping their toe in that style of racing, whether it's an IMSA or, or Pirelli World Challenge or SRL Blanc Pond, as it's called now, yeah. or even NASA, right, is the um, the car English is a, is a huge part of protecting yourself and preserving your own result. And what I mean by car English is where am I pointing my car at this moment, and is it a clear indicator to the car behind that I'm closing this door? Or am I leaving this door a little bit open? Or are they doing that to me, right? Like if I'm trying to overtake a car and there's a gap right now, and quite often you see drivers trying to pass up the inside and then the car ahead of them turns in and the guy that on the inside who gets hit or hits the car ahead, oh, you, it was my corner, I was inside of you. And there's all the who he said, she said of who was further up and back and forth. And if you look at the car English, right? If that door's open, but it's going into a closing gap, you got to assume they're going to shut the door, yeah. right? And so. On the opposite side of that, if I'm the car ahead and I make it very clear very early that I'm taking this, the prototype behind me who's coming up 20 miles an hour faster sees that and goes, all right, I'm going to wait till the next exit and get him on the throttle on the way out instead of stuffing it in on the entry. And, and that in itself is very valuable to not being surprised. But and you need to be aware of what's behind you probably 100 yards back or more, right? You need yeah. to see it before it gets to you. And that's what, one of the biggest things I talk about is patience, you know. Patience for yourself, but also having patience to set up for what's going to happen ahead. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I can honestly say, I mean, from an American to European transition, right, just knowing what I've known and experiencing it, like the how everyone is treated here in the U.S. in terms of, you know, contact is pretty gentlemanly, more or less, if you could call it that. When you go to Europe, the it's a different ballgame, man. It's like what's acceptable and what's not OK is completely different than what you're used to in the u.s you have to go in their elbows out and think yeah. that like someone's going to bounce off me and they're not even going to think twice yeah they uh they like to rumble over there in europe yeah for sure it's uh it's a it's a different aggression level i'll call it that if if there's a half a car width and i can make the corner i'm taking it <laughs> yeah for sure for sure so. So I know that, you know, you and Tyler in the GT4 last year in 2019, you know, won the championship. Congratulations on that. 
Thank and you. I know you guys were going to go, you guys were going to show again on a strong showing this year. And of course, you know, the season got red flagged after Daytona. Yeah. And you know, one of the most confusing things for me this season was IMSA, NASCAR, IndyCar all pretty much said, we're going to put a hold on our season. But SRO America took their cars to, well, the GT4 cars, at least, to St. Petersburg. And the, I know the IMSA GT3 Cup cars were there, too. They ran practice, and then all of a sudden, okay, you know, everybody else canceled, so we're going to cancel, too. But it's like, you yeah. at Coda the week before, everybody else was canceling after that weekend. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really tough one, right? Because there's so many gears that move behind the scenes. And so you have you have the series who rents the track space out, right? And then the promoter of that who's trying to get all the vendors in there and who's trying to get the sponsorship to pay for the event to offset the cost of the track rental because it's often quite a big number per day. Yeah. Um, and so what what SRO Blancpain has done, and I think it's a very smart move, IMSA does a similar thing, is, you know, even though the IMSA show is like the WeatherTech Endurance Series and then you have the GT4 cars that race yeah. and the P3 cars that race on the same weekend, you know, utilizing the same um, event to bring in more than one race series. SRO did that with other series that are running like IndyCar. And so the St. Pete weekend was actually an IndyCar hosted weekend. All exactly. of the mechanics behind it were the IndyCar promoters getting everything going. And so I think everyone went into it knowing what had happened previously, but they were going to try and like, let's see if we can get it done. And actually it was, I was there that weekend um, and had to come home early because it obviously got canceled mid weekend. Um, everyone was supposed to be on track Thursday they weren't quite sure how it's going to work, but because it was such a timeline and everyone was already in transit, it was a very quick time after the Coda race yeah. for them. Um, they decided let's show up and we'll kind of take it as we go. And the, the mayor didn't want any fans in the stands. There was no running on Thursday. I mean, nobody turned a wheel on Thursday, even though there's supposed to be cars on track. They had a couple meetings. They restructured the entire schedule. IndyCar dropped some sessions to get everybody their time. So all the people present could have their races still. Friday practice started, but there was a delay. It got to noon and they shut the whole thing down just because of the the growing concern for the population and the spread of the virus. And, um, you know, again, I think it's a necessity in, in these times. It's definitely a challenge when you're a racer and a competitor and you want to get out there and go. And you're like, well, I'm wearing a helmet and gloves anyways, but it's not just about you and the car. It's about, you know, your mechanics, your crew, uh, people at your hotel, that you're going to restaurants nearby. Like they're and now with everything kind of shelter in place or being closed, coming out of that phase a little bit, it still leaves a lot of question marks for, you know, can this area support uh, a mass of people, even on a necessity base of just the just the crew and the personnel coming into that space to go compete in an event? So, yeah, exactly. And, then, you know, that's kind of brought up the big thing this year, which has been a lot of the iRacing event, which has been getting huge numbers on TV. And yeah, YouTube and stuff like that. In fact, um, last well, when this airs a week ago from Thursday, I was watching the Thursday Night Blunder race that Dinners with Racers puts on with uh, Ryan Eversley and Sean Heckman uh, from the Mom, where they had uh, vintage GTP cars versus Pro Two comp trucks versus 410 wing sprint cars versus uh, GRC cars. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And so have you had, uh, have you gotten done any of the iRacing uh, stuff with either IMSA or the SRO stuff or? I have not done any current uh, competitions. I, I did use iRacing years ago, as I mentioned, when I did simulator work at the beginning of my career, but I honestly haven't played it since. Um, I've kind of fallen out of a logistically friendly area to keep a simulator set up. Yeah. Um, I was, I lived, moved to San Francisco in a very small apartment in the Marina district, which I enjoyed that phase of life, uh, but had zero space. Um, and now I'm in a place where I think I can set something up and not have the two and a half, three year old, you know, hanging off of the steering wheel constantly. So I, I'm trying to build a sim, but there's a big shortage on the parts. Um, so I would, I would love to do it. I've seen it. I've watched a lot of them. I've watched the dinner with racers. I've watched the uh, IMSA hosted ones. I've watched the SRO hosted ones. I know a lot of people who are racing in it. It's a lot of people we yeah. compete with on normal weekends. So, just uh, just don't let your little one hold the remote 
and turn off the monitors mid race like that happened to Denny Hamlin the other night in the NASCAR race. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine, you know, it's a it's a whole different uh, it's a whole different can of worms in terms of variables you have to to keep check of for this this type of racing. Exactly. I mean, and then but going also back to simulator because of your knowledge of Nurburgring, and I talked to Chris Constantine about this too. You guys, you know, there's a big controversy about Tesla running their car around uh, Nurburgring. And you worked with Chris Constantine at CXC Simulations about reverse engineering and running that car. Yeah. How, how was that project for you? I mean, that seemed like it was such a little interesting side project. Yeah, you know, it was it was an interesting side project. I mean, I, I got the call from Chris um, and Efren, the, the guy who handles a lot of his media stuff, and they came up and said, look, we think we've reverse engineered this thing. You you seem to be the guy that knows the track. Can you come down and drive it around and see what you think? And and so we did. We put a lap together, and, and, and mind you, you know, one lap is eight or nine minutes consecutive. So when you're thinking like, oh, I got to do one, at least one lap to get a feel for the car, one or two to warm up, like yeah, an, an hour goes by pretty quickly. But, um, but yeah, it was neat. It was neat to try it uh, because, you know, it's always, it's always fun to go to a place, you know, and then see it again virtually and see if like, Hey, all those little tidbits I learned about getting tighter to this curb, there's better camber down there. Let's see if it works. And you can kind of apply all the nuances that you've got gathered. Um, so it was a fun project to, to work with them on for sure. Now, with this project, would you feel that um, <laughs> no man dropping stuff off? The joys of being home doing your uh, doing your work. Um, do you feel that Tesla was honest with their lap time, or do you think there's some you know fudging in there? I, you know, that's a great question. Um, I know the driver that did do the Tesla lap because he was one of my teammates from SCG. Um, and actually two of the drivers they were talking about, but that being said, you know, Nerva ring is always one of those places where someone will run a lap, they'll post a video of it. And then there'll be a thousand people saying like, that's fake. They sped it up. They did this. They cheated that. So like, what they, like what they did with the Lamborghini and yeah, I mean, you know, at the end, end of the day, I think unless you're there physically present watching it happen, it's really, really tough to take somebody's word for it or to not even go down the path of, of thinking there may be a question mark there. So for me, I kind of blindly just say like, look, if they're saying they did that lap time, they probably did the lap time because maybe they didn't, but maybe no one really does. Like, you, you don't know, you're yeah. not sitting there. It's someone producing their own content. So um, I look at it and think it's probably realistic. It could have done that based on the weight and the power of the car. Um, I don't know what tires they were on, but tires make a pretty big difference. I know the I 918 Porsche had special tires when it did its lap um, after talking to some of the drivers that were involved in that. So, yeah, I mean, that nine, uh, that Porsche 918 was spectacular, but that 919 runs have been pretty insane around the spa and right. whatnot. It just it goes to show you what aero cars can do, right? Like mean, when you watch the abilities of them, and, and I've had the blessing of being able to see it from in the driver's seat or from times in the driver's seat of my car while they're passing me because we're in different classes. But, you know, a GT3 car that's modern today makes a fair amount of aero. Yeah. And it drives like an aero car. And then you see the prototypes now, and it's a completely different world. And you see what they can act, how late they can break, and how quickly they shed off speed because they have the extra aero load on the tire. And, but then again, how easy it is to lock up at the end of the brake zone because you're losing the aero load as you slow down rationally, it's a really tricky thing to do. Um, but it's, it's incredible what aero race cars have been able to achieve over the last 10 years. I mean, even 15, 20, you look back at, at cars that were prototypes, you know, in the nineties, right. And they're gorgeous oh, yeah. looking machines, but look at the lap time they produce and look at what things do now. And it's like the horsepower is actually not that different. No, you know, <laughs> it's really not. So now looking back on your, you know, almost, 15 year career now, you know, 15 to 12 to 15 year career, what would be the advice you give to your younger self? Oh man. Um, if I could give myself some advice at the beginning of the start of this, I think it would be to start networking earlier. Um, it's something that I've learned over the years that, you know, you never can have, too many uh, networks or friends or contacts in various directions because as you start to build a 
a Rolodex, if you'll call it that, um, a lot of business to business opportunities present themselves where you can use the race car as the marketing tool. Yeah. And both companies have a benefit out of it. And the and the bonus is that some of the profit from both people go into the race car. And that's how you can fund the racing program. In order to do that, you need to have contacts in various forms of business. And I think if I had could alert myself of that opportunity, knowing that it's going to take years to accumulate all of those contacts and just network, I would have started earlier than I did. Or yeah. maybe change the aggressiveness or the tactic or something like that. But just making it understood about how how valuable that can be or how reliant race teams are on the funding to be there right and it's like at the end of the day it costs quite a bit of money to do a 24-hour race as an example at daytona we use over 30 sets of tires for the weekend between the race itself qualifying and all the practice none of the race teams anywhere in the paddock get tires for free everyone has to pay full boat on them that's part of the agreement with the series and the tire company who sponsors it so we're buying 30 sets at $3,000 a set for one of the 65 cars that are out there just for the 24 hour race. Yep. You do the math on that and then you Mind extrapolate it, right? That's our tire bill is that much just for our car, right? Yeah. So that's not getting 12 people to the track for a week and their hotels and all their flights and all their meals. I mean, you start to add all that stuff up and you see why it's so important to have the funding to do it. Cause without the funding, the, the machine can't even move. No, exactly. Exactly. It's such a, it's such a big, you know, wheel and cog that you have to get going, you know, and it all, it seriously all comes down to money and what you can produce. You can, and, you can also compare it to like starting a business, right? Saying like, yeah. look, I, I have this idea of this company I want to launch. It's probably not going to make money in the first couple of years, but I think I can develop a market where I'll be profitable later. But in order to get to that point of profit for the inception of the company in two or three years later, it's going to take me X amount of dollars. Yeah. Right. It's, you can look at it a very similar way. They have a lot of parallels that way in that it still costs money to do, to even start a business. And then the other thing too, you know, going back and looking at the marketing stuff and then, you know, that would be one piece of advice. You've been able to have a pretty long career in sports cars. Are you, you know, and it seems like you're, main goal when you first started is probably going towards the formula car, like an Indy car or, you know, possibly formula one. Do you look back and think, I wish I could have been able to do both or find a way to do both or get my foot into another series or run a different car? Um, you know, there's bucket list events that draw me a little bit, but when I look back at, kind of the path that I've laid over the years um, and where I've ended up and where potentially I could have ended up had I stayed on a formula car route, as an example. Um, I don't really have any regrets or any thoughts that I wish I did it differently. I think I'm actually pretty happy doing what I did because I really yeah. enjoy how complex and how challenging endurance racing is because there's so many more variables for mistakes, the pit stops, the multiple drivers, the traffic, you know, that I really like that aspect of the, of the challenge. Um, you know, the Indy 500 is one that I think a lot of drivers would have on their bucket list and they would probably like to to be able to try or, or have a chance at winning. But, you know, I, don't, I think I think I'm pretty content with the path I have I have chosen or I have been able to you know create or, or had the opportunity to, to run. Yeah, I know my bucket list races would include uh, the spa endurance race, mm -hmm. of course, Le Mans. Yeah. And then uh, Bathurst. Those, so those three are three that are also on my bucket list. Um, I haven't so. done any of those, and I would really like to do them. Um, you know, it's the, for various reasons, if not just the history behind them. But, you know, no, I've exactly. driven Spa. It's, it's actually, what's funny is it's like an hour, maybe an hour and a half from Nürburgring. It's yeah. really close. Yeah. It's on the other side of the same forest, which is why it always rains in Spa, and it always rains in Nürburgring, and they seem to have this, like, weather thing going on it's because it's the same region um it i mean the track is incredible it is you rouge down the hill like the compression and then when you shoot up i we tested our glickenhaus car there uh while we were doing some development on some electronic systems and i was able to do that section flat but the sensation it gave my body was unlike anything i'd felt and this was probably in 2017 at any point in motorsports up until then so formula cars from 2006 
Formula Cars, Indy Lights, GT, Sports Cars, Daytona, go all the way to 2017, and it was a unique feeling. Because you, within about a one and a half second span, you go turning into this downhill drop to the left. So you're kind of in the upper right corner of your belts. You get to the bottom of the compression and you feed the wheel to the right to kind of aim the car as it goes through the dip. Yeah. Now you've gone from your upper right side of your belts to your lower right compressed and move across the bottom of the seat to the left side of the seat. So now you've done like basically uh, what's be a triangle as far as the force. Now you're shooting up the compression and your body gets light and you shoot to the top of your belts on the left side. And then you turn left and crest and you move all the way back around. And so in a one and a half second span, you feel the G-force like up right, lower right, across the seat, lower left, up left, and then back to center again. Oh, Meanwhile, you're trying not to lift. As you know, if you lift, you're going to unload the aero platform and spin into the wall. So you're like, <laughs> you're, you're going to have, have a Jensen button moment. <laughs> you're doing this roundy round thing and you're attacking the curb on the left that you can't see, which is blind. Because if you don't hit that curb and you miss it, there's no way you're staying on track. It's just too sharp. You can't do it. So yeah. it's a, it was a really, really cool place to drive. I mean, if anyone makes the trip or the sojourn over to Nürburgring, which I highly recommend, even if it's in a road car, it's so unique, it's worth seeing. If you go all that way and do it, actually spend a couple of mother another day or two and go to Spa and do the same thing because it's it's incredible. Yeah, one of our partners, uh, Air Motorsports, has a uh, you know is partnered with uh, RSR over in Nurburgring and Spa for yep. attractive events and whatnot. So that is that is definitely on the list of uh, places to go, places to see. You know, I've I've done them all from a spectator's view, but there's just you know, again, the competitor in me is like, I got to get out on that track. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I hear that. Jeff, I know it's uh, about time for the little one to start waking up from uh, his nap. And, you know, she's probably wants to have as much time with dad right now while dad's home and not on the road. Thank you so much for uh, joining me today. And uh, yeah, thanks, I want thanks for having me. It's been a blast. I really I appreciate want... the opportunity. I want you to take this time because I know that there's a lot of people that have backed you to allow you to compete last year, this year, and whatnot. So this is your time for uh, to say thank you to them. No, I mean, I, I will be the first to tell you I couldn't be where I am today without my partners. And it's not just the current partners now, uh, you know, TNBC, the Race for RP Foundation, Hill City, Hammer Nutrition, Sparco, uh, Bell Helmets. They've been with me for many, many years, but it even goes back to some of the partners I've had in the beginning of my career that helped me through the first couple of years. And I, I, a huge thank you to all of them because it's, it's basically uh, afforded me the opportunity to do what I love. And I love being able to continue that and support my family along the way. And uh, just much gratitude to everyone at Peregrine Racing at WeatherTech, you know, all the programs, Vital Speed, the guys I'm racing with there, the Click and House team in Europe. Um, Chris Rude runs the the yellow car with them over there and uh, and over here for the Coda race as well. So I'm very blessed and I appreciate everyone's help and contribution. So, and then if people want to follow uh, follow you, how can they follow you and see where your career is going and what you're doing? Um, I would say the best way to keep in touch with the now is probably Instagram. I update that one the most, um, and my handle is at Westfall Racing. Um, I would say another way to do it is via one of the teams that I'm affiliated with, which would be either Scuderia Corsa, which is Scuderia.Corsa or WeatherTech Racing. Uh, Vital Speed Competition, all of those on Instagram are pretty good places to do it. And then I have a website which has an updated schedule and press releases based on results, um, which is JeffWestfallRacing.com. So, all right, Jeff, thanks again for your time. Everybody, thank you for listening. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at ubertothepits.com. We are also now getting our interviews up on YouTube under the Uber to the Pits uh, channel. And ubertothepits.com, you can email me through there at the info at Uber to the Pits. Jeff, thanks again for your time, and hopefully we'll see you at the track soon. I appreciate it, man. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you. Cheers. Take care.